as Matthew was saying before, in, in last week's Torah reading, we had this huge Parsha, quaking, smoking mountain, sound of the shofar, God revealing the Ten Commandments to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. So these Ten Commandments were general principles. Today in Parshat Mishpatim, we get the details. And this is how they begin. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he's to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, and I don't want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the doorpost and pierce his ear with an owl. Then he will be his servant for life. There are some 613 commandments in the Torah. Why then does Parshat Mishpatim, the first code of Jewish law, begin with the laws of slavery? The answer is, the Israelites have just endured more than two centuries of slavery. Apparently, there's a reason why this happened. Centuries earlier, God told Abraham that it would happen, and I quote, as the sun was setting, Avram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick darkness came over him. Then the Lord said, no, for sure, for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. There they'll be enslaved and mistreated. So the experience of slavery was somehow necessary for the Israelites. Why? Because from the very beginning, God, who is the God of freedom, invited free worship by free human beings. But one after another, people abused that freedom, beginning with Adam and Eve, and then Cain, and then the generation of the flood and then the Tower of Babel. So God began again, this time not with the whole of humanity, but with one man, one woman, one family, who'd be the new pioneers of freedom. But freedom, it turns out, is very difficult. We seek it for ourselves, but we deny it to others when their freedom contradicts our own. This is so deeply true that within three generations of Abraham, Joseph's brothers wanted to sell him into slavery, a tragedy that didn't end until Judah was prepared to forfeit his own freedom so that Benjamin could go free. It took the collective experience of the Israelites, their own intimate, back-breaking, bitter experience of slavery, to turn them into a people who would no longer enslave their brothers and sisters, a people capable of creating a free society, the most challenging of all human tasks. In this context, it shouldn't be surprising that the first laws God commands after Sinai would all be related to slavery. In fact, it would have been surprising if this weren't the case. But now comes the real question. If God doesn't desire slavery, why didn't he just ban it completely? Why allow slavery to continue even if in restricted and regulated form? If God can split the Red Sea, produce water from a rock, rain manna from heaven, why not just alter human behavior? Are there certain areas where the all-powerful God is actually powerless? The answer seems to be yes. On one hand, freedom means creating space within the law which gives people the right to choose for themselves. On the other hand, people won't always make the right choices. How then to prevent people from doing harmful things without taking away all their freedom? This is where skillful planning and skillful teaching plays an important role. I just saw this in operation in Israel. Every day at breakfast and dinner, our hotels served huge quantities of an amazing variety of food. You really had to see it to believe it. However, I noticed that they put the healthiest food up front, while the more junky fun foods were placed in less noticeable locations. This is how food establishments subtly adjust what we can call our architecture of choice. And this is exactly what God does when it comes to slavery. He doesn't abolish it, but he limits it in such a way that it sets a process in motion that will eventually inspire people to abandon it altogether. And so, if after six years, the Hebrew slave wishes not to go free, he undergoes a stigmatizing ceremony, having his ear pierced, which remains a visible sign of shame. Also, every Shabbat, slaves can't be forced to work. These stipulations transform slavery from a lifelong fate into a temporary condition. Slavery then gets perceived as a humiliation rather than an inevitable destiny. Why does God choose to operate in this way? Because people must choose to abolish slavery freely if they're to be free at all. According to Maimonides, God can alter nature, but he chooses not to alter human nature. 
precisely because Judaism is built on the principle of human freedom. So God couldn't abolish slavery overnight, but God could change our architecture of choice. He could lead the stubborn horse of humanity to the water of freedom by signaling that slavery is wrong. But the God of freedom wouldn't force us to drink that water. We needed to be the ones to abolish slavery in our own time and through our own evolving understanding. Throughout history, there have been very powerful motivations to maintain slavery. Great civilizations were built with nearly unlimited free labor. Slavery is an economic engine like no other. So abolition took a few thousand years, but eventually it did happen. There are actually millions of similar issues of observance of morality in which God leads us, the stubborn horses of humanity, to water. But in the end, it's always up to us whether or not we choose to drink from the wellsprings of Mayim Chayim, the living waters of life. Shabbat Shalom.